Today is a big day because in front of me is the base model M1 Ultra Mac Studio. Now I'm calling this a base model because the way I see it, there are two distinct Mac Studios. There's the $2,000 one with M1 Max and the $4,000 one with M1 Ultra. With a $2,000 price jump in between, I think it's fair to split them up into distinct pricing brackets, and that's the way that I'm going to review it. So we're starting here with the 48 core version of the M1 Ultra. Tomorrow, I'll be bringing you guys coverage of the cheapest Mac Studio with the 24 core M1 Max. So make sure to get subscribed for that. But in today's video, we are gonna be putting this thing through its paces. No unboxing and first impressions here. Let's just get straight into it. So make sure to like and subscribe, turn on notifications so you don't miss any of my coverage, and let's get into it. Today's video is sponsored by Masterworks, an innovative investing platform founded in 2017 by tech entrepreneurs and a top 100 art collector. Masterworks lets you invest in contemporary art for just a fraction of what they would cost to purchase. With $1.7 trillion of wealth held in artwork and expected $900 billion in growth by 2026, contemporary art prices outpaced the S&P 500 total return by 164% from 1995 to 2021 an astonishing result. Historically, art is an asset class limited to the fabulously wealthy that can spend $20 million on a single piece. But with just a few clicks, Masterworks gives you access to all of that potential at a fraction of the cost. So far, they have sold three offerings with each returning over 30% to investors. With so much uncertainty in the market and top equity firm Morningstar even predicting negative growth in traditional stocks, now is a smart time to try something new with Masterworks. To skip the waitlist and join over 350,000 investors already diversifying their portfolios, head over to the link in the description below. And now, back to the video. Now I have to admit, I was a little bit worried when the Mac Studio got here that uh, the studio display wasn't going to get here in time. But fortunately, that wasn't a problem. Because here it is, the studio display. So, uh, looks a little different than I imagined it did, but let's get all of this set up and get into some benchmarks. All right, so first things first, um, a lot of people were asking me on Twitter to test out the internal speaker. So before we jump into performance and benchmarks, which I know you guys wanna see, um, well. Now in the last video, I was able to get these three piles of MacBooks working. They all have RAM, they all have hard drives. It's not terrible. It's, it's sort of a backup, is the way I would put it. Now, this is the M1 Ultra, which means 20 CPU cores and 48 GPU cores. And the first thing that I'm noticing is just how small this thing is, given what Apple said it was on par with. Also, I just put my hand by the vent, and the air coming out of this thing is actively cooler than the air in this room. It's actually air conditioning my studio right now. That's pretty cool. But with so much power in such a tiny package, it begs the question, when you're actually pushing the system, what are the thermals like? So let's find out just how well it copes. I'm gonna run the 10 minute loop of Cinebench, and while we have that going on, I've got TG Pro open here in the background, so that we can see what the temperatures look like. Now, we've already completed a few Cinebench runs. <laughs> this thing is going insanely fast, and the air coming out of the back is not warm yet. Okay, we're on the final run here. We're about to get our score. The temperatures, according to TG Pro, for most of the system are still around 40 degrees Celsius though it is worth pointing out that TG Pro doesn't yet support the M1 Ultra, so we don't have the exact readings for the CPU cores themselves. The air coming out the back has just crested above room temperature. 
it's slightly warm. And here comes our score now, 24,000. That is an insanely high score. Now granted, it's not as high as a Core i9 12900K. But rest assured, we will be doing a lot more in-depth testing. In fact, I'm building a PC with the specs that Apple compared the M1 Ultra to, the 3090 and a 12900K. So if you wanna see some comparisons between the Mac Studio and a custom-built PC, make sure to get subscribed. You'll also wanna get subscribed if you wanna see how the 48-core Mac Studio compares to the 64-core. But now I think what we need to do is get some more benchmarks on this thing and put it through its paces, comparing it to all the other Apple Silicon, my $10,000 iMac Pro. Let's get into it. All right, so to start off, let's go through some synthetic benchmarks with Geekbench 5 multi-core. Here we can see a 24,000 score for the M1 Ultra is vastly higher than all the other Macs and even some high-end Intel chips. However, as we saw with Cinebench R23, it's not the best for simulating the actual performance with a maxed CPU. So moving on to some other CPU tests, we have Novabench. This is running in Rosetta 2, so I wanted to see how it would perform when it's not as optimized. Similarly here, we have a V-Ray CPU test. In both of these tests, we can see that the M1 Ultra isn't quite keeping up with the 18-core iMac Pro, which gives you an idea of the impact Rosetta 2 has. Next up in graphics, we have Geekbench 5 Compute, where we can clearly see that the M1 Ultra 48 core outpaces the M1 Max significantly. It's even pretty much on par with a Vega 2 Duo, but an RTX 3090, even when running in OpenCL while the Max are running in metal, just absolutely crushes it. But over in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which by the way is running through Rosetta, we see a very respectable result with the M1 Ultra scoring 115 FPS, which is significantly higher even than the Vega 64 in my iMac Pro that doesn't have to do a translation layer. But now let's take a look at some real world applications, starting with video editing in Final Cut Pro. Now this was a bit of a weird test because in the Final Cut Pro render, where I stacked two 30 minute 10 bit 4K 60 FPS clips on top of each other, applied color correction and waited for that to render, we saw just a few minutes difference between the M1 Max in the 16 inch MacBook Pro and the M1 Ultra 48 core. Now, all of these were dramatically faster than the iMac Pro, and the same thing applies in the export time for that same project, but here even we can see that barely any time was saved going from the M1 Max to the M1 Ultra. And this continues over in DaVinci Resolve, where I took a 30 minute 10-bit 4K 60fps clip, color corrected, and did a ProRes export of that, and it took exactly the same time on the M1 Ultra as the M1 Max, literally down to the second, the same time. Moving over to Puget Bench Premiere Pro, the overall score on the M1 Ultra is just slightly higher than the M1 Max, but the GPU score is significantly better. And what's more, it seems to be scaling very evenly when you look at the M1 Max and the M1 Pro. It's also demolishing the Vega 64 my iMac Pro. Let's move on to 3D modeling, starting with Octane X and the teapot render, which is pretty stressy and clearly takes advantage of the GPU cores, because we can see a very clear scaling going from the M1 Pro taking more than 13 and a half minutes down to the M1 Ultra, which took less than five. Moving over to Blender, the BMW GPU render shows how Apple Silicon is able to flex its strength. And if you enable metal for GPU rendering, not only do the times decrease significantly, but you can basically see that every time the GPU cores double, the time basically cuts in half, going from eight to 16, to 32, to 48 GPU cores. And then if we look at the classroom render, we can see finally here, the M1 Ultra is actually beating the iMac Pro. Now this is in the CPU version of Blender, and there's a lot more in-depth Blender testing to come in future videos, so make sure to get subscribed for all of those. So that was a lot of benchmarks. 
and I didn't even get to run through my full suite. I have more that I wanna compare this Mac Studio 2. I'm gonna be comparing the 48 and the 64 core. I'm gonna compare the M1 Max version. I've also got a PC that I'm building over there that I'm going to be comparing. So there's a lot more tests to run that you're not gonna to wanna to miss. But initially, what we can take from some very in-depth tests is that the Mac Studio is a bit of a mixed bag. It depends on what you're doing. Apple Silicon is in a kind of a weird spot right now where in, in many respects, it's astonishingly fast. I mean, when you look at the Final Cut Pro render times graph that we had from earlier, everything just completely dunked on my $10,000 iMac. But that also includes the much less expensive and much less powerful M1 Pro. This, which has double the CPU cores and three times the GPU cores, only got you like three extra minutes on a really beefy render. So we're starting to approach the limits of, you know, these media encoders are doing a great job, but you only really need so many of them before the diminishing returns starts to set in. Uh, we saw that in DaVinci Resolve as well. But then on the flip side, we had stuff like Octane and Blender, which clearly takes advantage of the extra power, particularly the GPU power. In Octane and in Blender, we could basically see linear scaling. Every additional GPU core contributed to additional speed, and that is great. So if you are doing stuff like 3D modeling, this is the right direction. However, it's not quite there yet, because as you'll see when I compare this thing to a PC, and especially Blender running optics, the Mac has a long way to go. So what does that leave us with? Well, it's a bit weird, right? Because this is a $4,000 machine, which wasn't any faster than my M1 Max MacBook Pro at exporting a clip. Now, you could look at that and say, well, my M1 Max MacBook Pro was also $4,000, so this gives you more performance in a lot of other areas for the same price if you exclude peripheries or if you already have peripheries like I do. But then that means you could also look at it in the opposite way, which is that for about half the price, $2,200, you can get this Mac Studio with the 32 core M1 Max. And theoretically, at least when you're exporting your Final Cut project, at least with 4K footage, it's exactly the same. So it's very difficult to make generalizations like Apple does when they say, we are as fast as an RTX 3090 with less power or saying we are as fast as a 12900K because it's not the same in different areas. I mean, when you look at video editing, I'm sure this is faster in many ways than a PC setup. But when you look at 3D modeling, Apple just cannot compete with optics, which is exclusive to NVIDIA in Blender. So it is definitely not a black and white situation, which is why I try to have as many benchmarks as possible. I'm curious to know what you guys think in the comments down below. Personally, I'm gonna need to see more. We're gonna need to get more of these Mac Studios and test more things just to get an idea of where it is. So if you're looking forward to seeing that, let me know in the comments below. And you can also let me know by liking and by subscribing. So go ahead and do that and I will see you guys tomorrow in the next video.